Film and theology have been intricately entwined from the very inception of moving picture. For decades, some of the industry's most popular films have been artistic interpretations of stories from the Bible. I mean, even today, a select few of these films continue to maintain their status as icons of cinema. Cecil DeMille's The Ten Commandments, William Wyler's Ben-Hur, and even more recent examples like the animated film The Prince of Egypt, or Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. These films, and others like them, act as overt examples of the overlap between film and theology. But what of other films? What of Jurassic Park, Inception, The Godfather, or Star Trek? Can films traditionally seen as purely secular or religiously impartial be used as a means of communicating some greater moral truth? And what of the filmmakers? One would be hard pressed to find a director or a writer who's not trying to say something with their film. So is it appropriate then for an audience to attach a personal interpretation onto a film that was not meant to be interpreted like that? These are questions that, at least partially, are answered by two films, The Matrix and Harry Potter. Look, if you haven't seen the films by now, uh, spoilers, I guess? I, I don't know what to tell you. You've been warned. It's pretty universally accepted that Harry Potter contains theological parallels. J.K. Rowling has said it herself many times, and I mean even without her saying it outright, it's pretty overt. Harry Potter is the quintessential battle of light versus dark, good versus evil, and this is seen not only in each individual film but across the larger story arc of the series from Harry's literal self-sacrifice in The Sorcerer's Stone, to his first casting of the Patronus Charm in Prisoner of Azkaban, to the final showdown between him and Voldemort, the religious analogies are almost laughably obvious. So for a film like Harry Potter, it would be pretty normal for an audience to draw religious or moral parallels and apply them to their own lives. Despite the film's fantasy setting, they are very relatable. They deal with universally virtuous themes, love, death, friendship, with even more complex things like racism and classism lying underneath the surface. While this is a story beloved by people of all ages, Harry Potter is, ultimately, a children's story. And I know we're here to talk about the films, but just look at how the first book starts. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Drunnings, which made drills. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large mustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde, and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbors. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion, there was no finer boy anywhere. I mean, come on. If you want a 10-year-old to read your storybook, that's exactly how it should go. And what better way to introduce a young child to greater moral concepts than by giving them an engaging example that's written in a way they can relate to? No 10-year-old could relate to the complex messianic figure of Paul Atreides in Dune. But Neville Longbottom, standing up to Voldemort in order to defend his friends? That's absolutely something our young reader can resonate with for a young audience whose entire worldview is made by observing the examples of the people around them, this is paramount. While a bit more philosophical, and certainly not marketed towards children, 
The Matrix seems to similarly approach the theological parallel with a riveting discussion of change, self-actualization, and a savior manifested in the protagonist Neo. After searching for the answer to his question, what is the Matrix, Neo gets pulled out of the fictitious reality he's been living in where he discovers he may be the, quote, chosen one, a being who has been prophesied to free humankind. The number of religious references seemingly made throughout this film are too many to address in depth here, and they get more and more nuanced and far-fetched the further down the rabbit hole you go. And trust me, I went down the rabbit hole. Ignoring the rather obvious savior plotline, there is Morpheus's ship, the Nebuchadnezzar Mark III number 11, a blatant reference to the Protestant Bible which reads, And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. There's the refugee hideout, Zion, the oracle and her prophecies, Trinity as an entire character, the list goes on. Christian film critics, pastors, and others love discussing this film through a religious lens, with the dialogue naturally split between two points of view. The first largely agree with the film, using it as an allegory for humanity's spiritual journey, with Neo as the Jesus figure, and various tangential interpretations branching off from that. The second group harshly criticizes the film for making light of a holy subject, claiming it offers, at best, a watered-down sacrilegious version of the Bible's redemption story and ultimately should be avoided at all costs. Unlike with Harry Potter, however, the creators of this story, Lily and Lana Wachowski, have consistently maintained that their world, while certainly taking inspiration from a multitude of world religions, was not meant as a Christian allegory. And it was only until recently that Lily Wachowski confirmed what many fans had theorized for years. The Matrix was an allegory not for religion, but for the transgender experience. It's this key difference that drives my original question. Does it matter that the creators of this story have stated their film is not meant to be interpreted in this way? The thing about art is that it's subjective. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Life is what you make of it. Whatever you want to say. At the end of the day, I will react to a Jackson Pollock painting differently than you will. It will mean something different. Film is undeniably art. And with that mindset, you might say, well, it doesn't matter what the original intent was, the film is what I make of it. And to you, I would say, you're right. Probably. Because film is also literature. It should be analyzed in the same way we analyze Romeo and Juliet, or A Brave New World, or To Kill a Mockingbird. Take a film like Todd Phillips' 2019 Joker. That film premiered at the 76th Venice International Film Festival on August 31st, a full month before it was released to the general public. And while it was met with wildly positive reactions at the festival, it sparked a massive online debate regarding the story's sympathetic treatment of the main character, Arthur Fleck. Some people said the film brilliantly discussed mental illness and the consequences of society's disregard of the less fortunate. Some claimed the film sympathized with a homicidal maniac, romanticizing his violence and, as a result, would inspire real-world acts of violence. Regardless of the validity of these claims, the discerning viewer should be able to recognize the poignant examination of a broken system that creates its own monsters. Those who cannot see this, I would argue, have a tendency to hyper-focus on certain aspects of a film. Things like murder, sex, mass violence, or other morally objectionable material in a vacuum, without considering the larger reason as to why they exist. This entire discussion hinges on the idea of intent and ownership. Does intent even matter? And perhaps more importantly, who, quote, owns the finished product? 
not in a legal sense. Obviously, J.K. Rowling and Warner Brothers own the rights to the Harry Potter films, but rather in an interpretive sense. Once a film has been released, does the creator have any right to interfere with how it is interpreted? Communication is a combination of expression and interpretation. I was talking to a friend about this very thing, and he described it like this. The issue with intent is how overtly it's presented in the work itself. Most media is released in the context of global events, but if that is then taken out of context, does the intent remain clear? If so, it's undoubtedly valid. But if you have to see a tweet by JK Rowling years after the fact to know that Dumbledore is gay, is that equally valid? Maybe, but I guess that's the question you're trying to answer. This perspective strikes a very relevant chord. Do JK Rowling, the Wachowski sisters, and others have the right to retcon their original intent on a film that has already been presented to the public? As I implied earlier, the fear of real life repercussions to Joker were ultimately baseless. Nothing happened. The intent of the film seemed to be largely crystal clear. This is what happens when society ignores its lowest echelons. So will audiences in 50 years come to the same conclusion after watching the film without the immediate context of the year it was released? And if they don't, how does that speak to the film's efficacy? Would Todd Phillips, the director and writer, have the right to say, no wait, that's not what I meant? Look, there's nothing wrong with watching Harry Potter for nothing more than a fantastical tale told in a visually appealing way. But for those who wish to look deeper into a film and dissect what exactly it might be trying to say, Harry Potter provides a readily available avenue for just that. A young boy thrust into a world that, unbeknownst to him, is waiting with bated breath for him to reach his full potential and fulfill his prophesied destiny to save them from unfathomable evil. It sounds familiar for a reason. Conversely, there's perhaps no harm in watching The Matrix and deriving a deeper, Christian-based meaning from it. It's not like there's a lack of potential examples to work with. So that brings us back to the original question. What responsibility does the audience have to uphold the creator's original intentions? And ultimately, I'm going to give the perhaps unsatisfying answer of, it depends. Intent clearly plays some part in a film. Harry Potter, The Matrix, and Joker wouldn't have had the cultural impact they did without it. But whether an audience should create meaning where there debatably is none, perhaps all gets boiled down to the well-used adage, art is subjective. <laughs>